Hi, Internet. This is David Roberts, climate and energy writer for Grist.org, everyone's favorite nonprofit environmental news site. I just got back from a year-long sabbatical from my job, during which I didn't work and mostly wasn't on the Internet. I wrote a, a piece in Outside Magazine. Pick it up on your newsstands, I think. They still have newsstands. I've written a couple of follow-ups to the piece on the blog. I've also had all these other questions coming from people about bits and pieces of the experience that I thought I would just make a video and answer them all at once so that I can get back to writing about climate doom and gloom, which is my day job. Karen Tumulty, great longtime reporter with Time Magazine, now with Washington Post, asks, did you cheat? I didn't have super hard and fast rules. I was unable to completely cut myself off from the news cycle. I'm too hooked for that. I'm too into American politics to totally let it go. So there are one or two blogs I followed. My main rule was to be quiet on the internet, to not tweet, post, forward, star, pin, favorite, not to do anything, not to speak up. It was to be quiet on the internet. And that rule I did not cheat on, except for a couple of tweets in early January to announce my music mix, but I had already planned that. But otherwise, I found it quite easy to go silent, and it was uh, both easy and incredibly refreshing, so I was not tempted to cheat. Nick Janos asks, other than intense self-control, how will you avoid falling back into the same patterns, routines, and habits that led to your break? That is the central question of my life at the moment which is this year break, was it any good for anything? Intense self-control is going to have to play a role, of course, since no sort of change you implement in your life is gonna stick without some intense self-control. And this is why, as I've been writing on the blog, it comes back to sort of mindfulness, that exercise of self-control is in fact an exercise and you can get better at it. That's all meditation is, this strengthening this capacity for mindfulness, to bring yourself into the present, to choose what you wanna be doing rather than acting on habit. So I'm going to do a couple of things. One is take regular breaks. Everybody should take regular breaks every hour and a half, two hours. Take 15 minutes and go walk around the block or get coffee. Um, two is I'm going to turn off all push notifications, which means, you know, when you get an email, it goes bing and flashes and you get a tweet and it goes doing and flashes and you get a Facebook like, boom, a chat, ding. So your computer becomes this sort of distraction machine and every time when you're focusing on a task your attention is distracted like that you lose doesn't feel like much but you lose a few seconds and it takes your brain a little time to reorient itself back to the task and you know there's been a lot of research on this now and you lose the equivalent of like 10 to 20 IQ points for a little while until you're back on task and then by the time you're back on task boom there's another one. This is a horrible way to work. It kills productivity, it kills creativity, it kills flow, the sort of feeling of being really absorbed in something so that your sort of ego disappears and you're just completely in something. And all those alerts and notifications and pings can be turned off. So now on my phone and on my computer, if I wanna go check email, it's because I've decided I have a second free to go check email. Not because the program decided, oh, it's time for me to do it. I've also unsubscribed to close to 300 email subscriptions <laughs> since I got back, which has chopped my email traffic by two thirds or so. Little things like that. And then there's a lot of just, you know, it's just scheduling. If you want to do something other than stare at the screen, you have to schedule time to do it. That's all it is. So you need a reminder that goes, boom, get off the screen, you jerk. So let's talk again in a few months and we'll see if I'm sticking with any of it. Ben Martin asks, do you think internet addiction is a substantial problem? As I've come back from my break and all these sort of media outlets want to talk to me about it, I hear that word addiction a lot. And I really don't like it. There is debate now about whether to put internet addiction into the, uh, whatever the official, I forget what it's called, the official psychology manual of diseases and disorders. But honestly, most of the people who I think could fairly be called internet addicted are addicted to online gambling mostly and, and, and really have devastated their lives and their finances through this stuff. And I don't think that the kind of thing that me and the people I know do, which is, you know, whatever, tweet too much, spend too much time online, really qualifies as addiction. I think we have this tendency in the U.S. to kind of pathologize everything or medicalize it. It's almost like we don't feel like we can have understanding for and compassion for people who have this problem unless 
it's a disease. Using the word addiction is our way of kind of groping toward compassion for people who have this problem, but I don't think it's particularly accurate. It is true that by virtue of people's work, white collar work, information work, whatever you call it, they are forced to be online a lot and forced to be in proximity to these web services and tools. And these web services and tools have been designed by their makers to be addictive, to make you want to come back to them over and over and over again because they are supported by advertising. And as long as they're supported by advertising, they live or die by bewitching you, by getting you stuck on them and clicking on them more and more and sharing more and more information. I think that does lead to a lot of sort of unhealthy behavior in the sense of just spending too much time doing one thing, which is never healthy. I don't think the word addiction really is helpful in understanding what's going on though. Uh, Banjo Bob asks, collectively and long term is pinging slash digital dopamine a fundamental threat to earth awareness? And I've gotten lots of variations of this question. I think the unspoken premise is that something about being online is unnatural and artificial where, I don't know, taking a walk through the woods is natural. I don't think that distinction makes any sense in today's world. I think there's no such thing as a purely natural experience or a purely natural environment anymore, if you mean untouched and unaffected by human hands. I don't think there's anything quote unquote unnatural about being online or about the friendships we form online. All I would say is that there's a lot of science that shows that exposure to nature, exposure to natural settings is correlated with a lot of positive health benefits, increased focus, increased retention, more emotional stability, greater ability to self-regulate, all these great things that come out of exposure to nature. And they found that prisoners on the side of a prison facing a natural scene have lower recidivism than prisoners on the other side of the prison. They found that hospital patients who are at the side of the hospital that faces out towards trees or nature recover faster than someone facing like a cityscape. It's really amazing. The more they do research, the more it seems that exposure to nature has these sort of miraculous health effects. I think exposure to nature is an unmitigated good. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I think you can say that without saying that time online or that internet mediated relationships and friendships are unnatural or, or artificial. But more nature is good, yes. Boom.